Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our transfer pricing webinar of today. So, first of all, I would really like to apologize for our first uh, miss, missed start. We had technical issues, um, but now we are all good to go. And uh, for those who couldn't make or cannot make it today, we will have a second opportunity to attend the webinar on 6th of December at 9 a.m. Um, so maybe you might, if you could go to the first slide. Uma. So today we really seem to have, uh, <laughs> yes, perfect. So before we start, I would like to, um, you know, to, to sort out some housekeeping questions. So first of all, we are now a little bit uh, a smaller uh, crowd as, as initially expected. So this will give you more time to actually ask your questions. I ask everybody who has questions to, uh, to write them on the chat button and please make sure that the questions are addressed to all panelists. So to ensure that we will not miss your questions. Also after the, the, the webinar, you will receive a feedback form. So we kindly ask you to fill that in. It would really help us to further improve and ensure that we talk about issues which are really important for you. And last but not least, please note that this Web WebEx is, is recorded. Uh, we will send the recording to you um, shortly after the webinar of today. With that, I can come to our, our today's presenter. So we have uh, Uma. Uma is heading our transfer pricing practice here in Qatar. Um, she will be supported by Diego and Tamir, both uh, experienced managers, uh, and we are all based here in Qatar. So before we really go into the, the matter and we discuss, uh, you know, the, the today's topic, I would like to, to, to take a step back. So if we look what happened in the, in the tax landscape here in Qatar, it was an incredible development. Some years back, maybe five years ago, um, the tax authorities, they focused on compliance only, and there it was more form over substance. So it was not really, um, you know, a review did happen. It was just like, you know, collecting the tax returns, collecting the taxes, and that's it. Then a couple of years ago with the RIBA, the focus on compliance was enforced and no and new um, reporting requirements kicked in with uh, county by county reporting, contract reporting, simplified return for exempt entities. So all still a focus on, on compliance. And now this again is changing dramatically. So um, only I think last week, probably a lot of you have seen that um, Qatar agreed with the European Union that they will reform the foreign sourced income tax regime here in Qatar. And this needs to be done as early as end of 2022. And of course, we also have PEPS 2.0, which where Qatar signed up to, a, to or agreed with a global minimum tax of 15% for big multinational. But all of this will most likely have a huge impact on, on, on the tax regulations and the environment here in Qatar. So we don't know yet what will be the end solution, but for sure we will have very soon a webinar which will be focused on BEPS 2 and also, uh, you know, the foreign sourced income tax regime and discuss in more depth what, what this exactly means for, for all of you. And I did not even mention VAT, also there we, we see some movements. So, um, you know, we see that um, th there are new um, questions asked to certain groups of companies, industry groups, uh, and also there are, you know, some, some sort of regulations which, which are already around. There is still no official announcement, but it becomes more and more likely that VAT will really come uh, to Qatar very, very soon. However, with that, uh, we will go back to the topic of today, which is transfer pricing. And I will hand over, um, or I will have a look at the agenda. So first we will, Uma will do a quick recap on transfer pricing. Then uh, Diego will, will talk about the lessons learned during this first 
filing year uh, when we had to file, uh, you know, transfer pricing documentation. And then the MIR will will uh, talk about the key takeaways and the way forward. So to really summarize what is important and what each and entity needs to be co to consider for for the future. And then we will have enough room to answer your questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to just put your, your questions on the chat during the, the webinar. With that, I would like to hand over to Uma, who will give us a quick recap on the transfer pricing regulations in Qatar. Thank you, Barbara, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in in this uh, revised session. Um, so let's start with a quick recap on transfer pricing as a subject, as well as a recap on the transfer pricing regulations in Qatar. So what is transfer pricing? Uh, transfer pricing is nothing but the price that is applied on transactions entered between related parties. These transactions could be in the form of purchase, sale of goods and services, tangible or intangible assets, and may also include uh, intercompany loans or group financing. What typically happens is, or can happen potentially, is that uh, related parties could influence these prices in a way that they are not representative of market prices or arms and prices. And how would they do that is basically trying to overcharge or undercharge uh, the prices in a way that would impact the overall profitability and tax expenses for the related parties. Why is this important? Uh, of course, this is important because we have provisions in the tax laws that are designed to counter these uh, practices and to challenge the transfer pricing. They do expect, the regulations do expect that the pricing should be at arm's length. Uh, when we say arm's length, it is nothing but the prices that third parties or independent parties would agree to for a similar transaction in uncontro uncontrolled uh, circumstances. Now, these regulations bring in added exposure towards tax adjustments or transfer pricing adjustments towards additional penalties and litigation. With that base, let's just now look at what does a transfer pricing analysis entail. A transfer pricing analysis typically would begin with understanding the nature of transaction and the terms and conditions involved in the transaction, uh, having an understanding of the contractual obligations on each of the related parties in the transaction. Once that base is understood, the next step would of course be to uh, conduct a detailed functional analysis and this would involve a uh, discussion with business personnel to try and understand better what kind of functions each related party performs, what kind of risks do they assume in the transaction, and what kind of assets do they need to employ to execute the transactions. Once step one and two are done, it is easier and it, it is possible to characterize the transaction and characterize uh, the related parties. Once that is done, the next step would be to select a TP method. So when we say TP method, these are five specified methods or prescribed methods by the OECD. Here on the right side, you can see all the methods listed and it starts with comparable uncontrolled price method where the price prices of the transactions are compared. The rest of the methods, except for profit split, uh, focus on comparison of margins and profit split focuses on review of the contributions of related parties. Now, when we look at the Qatar regulations, uh, the Qatar regulations have considered comparable uncontrolled price method as a preferred method in the, you know, when they talk about selection of methods. But it's very important to understand that it may not necessarily be the me best method. So we, in our practice, we have seen that the taxpayers are tempted to select comparable uncontrolled price method, mainly because it is the preferred method. But it's important to analyze that whether it is the best method given the nature of the transaction, 
and the characterization of the related parties. So our recommendation is always to give equal weightage to all the methods while selecting the most appropriate method. Once the most appropriate method has been selected, then it comes down to application of the method. This would entail selection of comparable prices or comparable entities for a marginal analysis. Once this analysis is done, the out, you would get your outcome of uh, determining the arms length price or the arms length price range. Now let's have a quick recap on the um, executive regulations and what kind of provisions are included therein. Starts, of course, with the arms length uh, principle. It's important to understand that the arms length principle is, uh, in fact, you know, a principle that has been there in the tax regulations right from 2010. And uh, the current regulations have basically just extended and expanded on the original uh, requirement and provided more formalized, uh, you know, requirements. So the next uh, requirement is then the pricing analysis. So the executive regulations expect that all, all uh, taxpayers conduct a pricing analysis and determine the arms and prices at the time of entering into transactions with related parties. The latest they can do this is by the time of filing the tax return. And like we discussed earlier, a pricing analysis would entail a functional and comparability analysis. Then the next requirement is the reporting requirement. And this starts with uh, filing of the transpricing declaration along with the tax return, followed by a separate requirement to file the master file and local file. Now it is important to understand that filing uh, the, the reporting requirements are applicable only to those taxpayers who meet certain thresholds uh, and only they are required to do an, a compulsory upfront reporting of transactions and filing of the master file local file. Now at this stage, I would request you, know, you to take a step back and understand that the reporting requirement and the transfer pricing analysis are two separate requirements in the executive regulations. So if an entity is falls outside the thresholds for reporting requirements, they are still required to conduct some level of transfer pricing analysis and have some level of TP documentation, which will be important at the time of an assessment. Because if a transfer pricing assessment is opened up, uh, the tax authorities would only give 30 days to submit uh, your transfer pricing analysis, submit supporting documentation, and 30 days may not be a time that is enough to start the entire analysis end to end. Uh, hence, it is important and not just important, it's also uh, prescribed in the regulations that the taxpayers are then required to maintain contemporaneous documentation, maintain timely analysis so that it is easily available mm -hmm. at the time of an assessment. This is basically a quick snapshot of the thresholds and uh, the timelines. Uh, I won't go in detail, but just to let you know that we've already had uh, two, su two successful rounds of filing for country by country reporting, and we are into our third cycle right now. And we've gone through the first successful filing of TP declaration master file local file for the year 2020 through the Dariba system. While it has been, you know, uh, you know, we were able to do those uh, filings for the first year. I must say that there were uh, certain challenges and certain uh, difficulties that we had faced vis-a-vis uh, -vis the regulations, the way they were drafted and the Dariba system. And I would at this stage hand it over to my colleague Diego, who will take you through these challenges that we faced in the first year. Thanks, Diego, Uma. Over to you, Diego. Thanks, Uma. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. And well, now, as my colleague mentioned, now we'll talk about the practical challenge and key learnings we experienced in the first year of filing. We identify five main factors. The first one is about the no proper documentation supporting the transaction. Uh, yes, 
here we can see this in the we identify five main bubbles. So this is the first one. It means no proper documentation like agreements and pricing policies to support the transactions uh, when determining the remuneration calculated. And considering this was the first year of submission, and this was a, either a learning curve for taxpayers, for us, and also for the tax administration, uh, it's expected that in the coming years, the tax administration will be more demanding and exigent of the information that should be included in the TP documentation. From the taxpayer side, it's very important that in the next years, we will, uh, you are, we will be more careful about all the information that is included in order to support the transactions with related parties in the, that will be included in the TP documentation in order to support all these type of transactions and to, and to fulfill all the requirements. As a second, as a second point when defined, this is a tedious process. Considering this uh, a high volume of information, the round of questions or meetings we we should have for the correct preparation of TP documentation. Hence, it would take a certain amount of time for a proper analysis, preparation, and revision of the of the files of the, or the local file and master file in this case. Thus, it is extremely important to not leave this process to some days before the submission deadlines. As a third point, we have is we are talking, we are going to talk about the relevance of the adoption of the TP policies. First of all, what's a TP policy? This is a document where we analyze and also we uh, go in detail about the, uh, the TP methodology that should be applicable for the intercompany transactions in advance and to secure the compliance with the arm's length principle. In this case, we'll minimize the risk of potential TP adjustments. For example, it's important that when we are setting a new transaction or when we are signing a new intercompany agreement to consider this methodology to, to, to determine the correct pricing policy. And besides the compliance aspect, a TP policy may bring internal control improvement and savings, for example, by lowering expenses paid to related parties. As a fourth factor, uh, we have the inconsistencies between local regulations. Uh, there are some uh, discrepancies about the applicability of the of the master file and local file, uh, the, submi uh, the applicability for the submission of master file and local file as per, for example, executive regulations, resolution number four, and the FAQs. And last but not least important, that the, that the, the processing derived by section wise. As many of you have seen, this process requires multiple attachments for the submission. This may cause more time spent and more efforts for submission. And taking as an example in other jurisdictions, it is possible to attach uh, the documents, in this case, the TP documentation, as a whole document, only once. However, here in Qatar, it's not possible, and we have to split the files into several sections. In the next slide, now we will go into detail and deeper about uh, one of the topics I just mentioned, about the inconsistencies between executive regulations, FAQs, and the RIVA. Here we have an example of a multinational group with a parent company and at quarters that are domiciliated in Qatar and two subsidiaries, one in Oman and one in Qatar. If we take into consideration the executive regulations and the resolution number four, all three entities in Qatar, which are ABC Parent, ABC HQ, and ABC Qatar, will have to submit local file and master file. However, if we consider what is mentioned in the FAQs, it says that for the submission, it's required that more than 50% of direct or indirect holding of, of capital or working rights of the foreign entities. And in this scenario, only ABC Parent and ABC HQ will have to submit a local file and master file. Because if we see in this graph and in the arrow that we are uh, highlighting, ABC Qatar doesn't have direct or indirect holding over the uh, related party abroad, which is in Oman. 
Um, if we can also now in order to publish this uh, case in the next example, in the next slide, sorry. Also, we can see another type of extractor. We have, a, a, in this case, we have a company that is domiciliated in Qatar, which is XYZ Qatar, which is in purple. And it has two shareholders, one in Qatar and one uh, in the UAE. The, the, the major shareholder, however, is here in Qatar with 51%, and the, and the shareholder in the UAE only have 49%. Similarly, as the previous example, under executive regulation and resolution number four, both entities in Qatar will have to submit local file and master file. However, under FAQs, and consider the factor that is the, the, the foreign shareholder doesn't have the majority of the voting rights or capital, under this scenario, XYZ Qatar will not have to submit local file and master file. Uh, even I mentioned many times uh, through these two examples, the factor of the shareholding and majority of voting rights. Also, there are other factors to, to, that is very relevant when, the, when we ask ourselves if, a, if we are applicable or not applicable for master file and local file. One of them is the beneficial ownership. We have some cases that, if, uh, that even the foreign shareholder only have 49% of the shareholding, the location of profits is more than that, let's say, of 51%, 60%, or 70%. Under these circumstances, it's very important that we also consider the preparation of both documents because we are, we, it's very, it's very, uh, it's visible, it's visible that the, ma the majority of the profit of the profits is going abroad. And it's highly probable that it will be, uh, question and also a question by in the future by the tax administration. Also, we have to secure that this transaction, that the potential transactions with related parties are under Amsterdam principle. Also, it's very important to consider that even some entities are not fully required for the submission of local file and master file. It's very important to prepare and maintain in advance both types of documents, the local file and master file considering that the ETA may request this documentation within 30 days in, in any time. And as I mentioned before, the preparation of these documents requires certain amount of time for the uh, for proper analysis and revision. Um, considering other mature markets, this is considered as a best practice. Now, uh, through these examples, here also we can see on the arriba, which is that why sometimes we mentioned that uh, we need certain amount of time for the revision, analysis, and preparation of local file and master file. The, here we can see some extracts on the arriba that uh, the, 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 soft, the, the platform uh, requires a, a certain amount of information. As you can see, this information is, uh, is section-wise and requires multiple attachments. Uh, also, some tables are required to be filled manually. And one point that I would like to highlight on, into this is that both local file and master file cannot be submitted separately. So if one of the documents is still missing, the full process, the, the full process of submission cannot be completed. We have some cases that uh, the master file wasn't 100% ready, so the submission process couldn't be finalized. And now, uh, in the next slide, I will highlight some practical insights about uh, we have identified during these first years of TP filings. As I mentioned in the last slide, we have, we, we, we require uh, detailed information for the correct submission. This detailed information uh, can be, for example, uh, details for competitors, uh, business strategies, drivers of profits, business restructuring, etc. And also you may see, you have seen that this information is already predefined by the GTA on the RIVA. So if we, if we don't fulfill all the required information, it's not, uh, the process cannot be completed accordingly. So it's very important that we have all the information 
and we and we have and we can provide all the required data. And also, as I as I mentioned, uh, this type of information is not only we are not talking about financial information. Uh, we are talking about other aspects that involve uh, the, uh, the business itself. So this this is a different process. The the, the processes that we are uh, the typical we we are used to when we uh, proceed, for example, for audit purposes or to, for the preparation of, of a tax return. So it's very important to consider that when we are uh, analyzing all the information that is required. Also, because it's very relevant that for a better understanding of the business and also for the preparation, preparation of functional analysis or a better understanding of the, of the, what's happening behind the business, behind the finance, what is reflected on the financial statement to, to have discussions and meetings with the, with each of, of the business units that are involved in order to, to also to have their, their point of view and also to have uh, their proper insights. Now for the next section, I will hand over to my colleague, Damir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Diego, for uh, guiding us through major lessons uh, learned during the last TP documentation submission period. So I would like actually to, to guide you through what is expected uh, from a transfer pricing perspective for the next financial year. And in the in the following slides, you will see certain aspects that are crucial uh, in this in this respect. So firstly, uh, I will talk about uh, corporate in income tax return submission. So it is very important that the uh, corporate income tax return is submitted in the RIBA system uh, in order to access TP documentation uh, submission web, web, uh, web pages. To submit the master file and local files successfully, the taxpayer needs to ensure that the related party abroad box is ticked in the RIBA portal. We have noticed in several instances that either the external advisor or the client uh, uh, itself has not ticked this uh, box or not submitted the tax return on time. Uh, this happened uh, in a project where we were not involved in preparation of transfer pricing declaration. That said, all of the master file and local file have been ready. It took some additional time for coordination uh, to make those amendments and to be able to submit TP documentation. Therefore, a special, a special attention uh, needs to be paid uh, to timely submission of tax return and ticking the appropriate boxes, uh, which will enable further submission of DP documentation. Then a uh, second aspect that is uh, very important is uh, preparation of TP declaration. Preparation of TP declaration requires a generally significant uh, input in terms of uh, analysis of all intergroup transactions. We have noticed in the, in the, in the market that not enough thoughts have been put into this uh, TP declaration process and that uh, probably the clients or uh, um, um, they, 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 they consider that this is just uh, similar to the, for example, tax return and that is just related to the, to the figures. But uh, the preparation of TP declaration is crucial and very important as well as preparation of TP documentation because uh, they are interlinked, they are in, in interdependent. Whatever it is declared in TP declaration statement will be subject to further analysis uh, in TP documentation. So that's why it is important to understand what information uh, is required for TP declaration and accurately as well to provide this necessary information to, to advisor. The TP declaration for, for fiscal year 2020 shall consider as well a prior year methodology, but this is as well the, the chance or the last chance to use as a fresh look to see uh, in case certain methodologies were not appropriately selected during the TP declaration process, and then to improve that in the, uh, in the next fiscal year. Work on intra-group uh, transactions and proper understanding uh, should start at latest one month before the deadline for submission of TP declaration. We have instances where uh, we were approached a uh, few, few, few days before the submission of the tax return. And this, depending on the uh, significance of the intercompany transactions and uh, uh, transaction types, this can uh, impact, of course, our, our analysis. So that's why uh, you, you need to keep in mind that this work as well should start much, much earlier. One aspect of uh, arm's length uh, Einstein principle is preparation of benchmarking studies. 
and uh, intergroup transactions, they need to be uh, analyzed from, from an Iceland perspective. And the benchmarking studies are performed uh, in, in that respect. So the benchmarking studies are conducted in uh, special databases where the comparable companies are looked for or searched for. And benchmarking study needs to be updated every three years. But financial data of those comparable companies uh, needs to be updated every year. So if the new search, for example, was prepared for fiscal year 2020, which was behind us, and the available information in database was for fiscal year 17, 18, and 19, then for fiscal year 2021, that means like next fiscal year, then the benchmarking study will roll out to the subsequent fiscal year, and that will be 18, 19, and 20. However, uh, even though the databases are updated on a, on a weekly basis, a uh, company's uh, financial information is usually uploaded in the databases by the end of November. So that means in, in, this, in this period to, let's say, mid-February or early February for the prior financial year. So that needs as well to be uh, considered. And uh, another aspect that is relevant for benchmarking studies is that in, in the Middle East, there is a lack of potential comparable companies compared, for example, to mature markets, such as uh, Europe, Americas, Australia. Those, uh, uh, because the databases have not sufficient inf information on those, on those companies. So given that no uh, category entities are generally identified within the database, what is our experience in the past uh, TP documentation submission uh, uh, season, the benchmarking report will use then Middle East and African entities as a geographical region for potential comparables because this region is more comparable than, for example, Europe or some mature markets uh, in comparison to Qatar, of course. And we have aligned as well uh, on this topic with our uh, Middle East colleagues, and they, this is the standard standard procedure in the in the region. And even if the, uh, for example, uh, tax authorities would um, require the local companies, then this uh, our process is. Uh, evidence and documented, and we can show them that they are no uh, sufficient comparables. So uh, the next uh, point uh, that is extremely crucial for, for transfer pricing is intercompany agreements. And that means formal intercompany agreements. We have noticed that many uh, uh, um, taxpayers have no intercompany agreements in place. And maybe to just to, to say what intercompany agreement means. This is intergroup agreement or TP agreement. Basically, it is a signed contract between two or more associated entities, and that contract governs the general terms and conditions. Of course, depending on the on the nature of the transaction, the, the agreement can differ, but there is uh, certain basic requirements from a transfer pricing perspective that need to be considered in each transfer pricing agreement. That is, for example, who are the parties, what is the considerations to describe the control transaction description, what is the arm's length remuneration, termination, whether there is a room for year end adjustment, uh, force measure, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is then the starting point for the tax authorities to uh, analyze the transaction. And usually the intercompany agreements are helpful in drafting the local file because when we are talking about certain trans transactions, we as well as the uh, tax authorities are looking into those, those agreements. So in case of non-existence of intercompany agreements, which we notice uh, it's, uh, uh, it's in the market, this will need to be changed going forward. Then because third party when entering into certain transaction will enter into the agreement and this is replicated as well to uh, related party behavior. Uh, behavior. Uh, in case of absence of intercompany agreements, further investigations are likely to occur and the, then the tax authorities will request email correspondence, internal notes, uh, etc., et some other documents, uh, because uh, they will uh, need to understand what actual transaction is about. And still then, considering that there is no existence of intercompany agreement, they might uh, have some different uh, conclusion. So uh, our message is that any new intercompany agreement or the amendment of the existing agreement should be reviewed from, from a transfer pricing perspective. It is important to ensure that uh, those intercompany agreements are in line with the rea reality, with market standards, and as well consistent with the TP documentation. The last uh, aspect that, we, uh, that I will uh, talk about is about penalties. 
uh, we have noticed as well that uh, uh, because you uh, submit the DP documentation in the RIBA system, in case there is a late submission, then the penalty is uh, automatically calculated in the RIBA system, 500 rials per day. This penalty is actually uh, applicable for failure to submit a tax return and not to master file and local file. We have communicated this to uh, GTA, but we have not received uh, so far any, any response to that, and we are, of course, following in this respect. However, we, we have noticed that um, in uh, certain, in, or in few instances, the GTA accepted waiver of penalties only for those tax, taxpayers and certain taxpayers that have no outstanding tax amounts due. However, this is just a sporadic case and cannot be relied to. So the uh, the message as well that we are uh, sending to you that the, uh, those deadlines need to be follow, followed and uh, uh, submission should be should be on time. Then uh, uh, when it comes to the audit experience, several clients uh, approach us uh, that they were surprised with the level of uh, complexity and time efforts put into the preparation of transfer pricing documentation. But taxpayers might be even more surprised uh, when they realize that in spite of all that effort that was put into the uh, TP documentation, that the tax authorities can still review their work and come up with totally different conclusion, which will require them to, to pay more taxes. So compared to other tax areas, the level of uncertainty uh, that comes with TP compliance is uh, relatively higher. Uh, however, the opinions and contra arguments are discussed uh, during the tax audit uh, that can last a longer time depending on each on each case. Then I would like to uh, go to the to the next slide and explain actually uh, the the major business events that are uh, that are occurring within the within the some organization or some uh, multi multinational group. So we can have, for example, Qatar headquartered company. That company is usually, uh, from a transfer pricing perspective, uh, entrepreneur or principal, and this company will have. Uh, multiple or several intergroup trans transactional flows. Those flows can be cross-border and domestic. So there could be uh, cross-border and domestic intercompany transactions. And they are both relevant from transfer pricing perspective. Pricing policy for both of those transactions are generally, uh, uh, should, should not deviate. So they should be the same. If we, are a, if we have a service provider in, in Qatar that is providing a service to Qatari entity and providing the same service to, for example, entity in Oman and uh, pricing policies, for example, uh, cost plus, let's say 7%, then this should be consistently uh, applied. Then another aspect is, for example, for inter-company or intergroup financing, we have as well noticed that there are several entities uh, that are performing those intra-group financing activities. So that means they are acting as, as a bank, as a, a, as, as a, simple, a simple example. So why this is a crucial from a transfer pricing perspective is because this, uh, the, the group companies that act as lenders, they should get the arm's length return on this lending. So that means like uh, what the third party would earn when lending some, some funds. And as well, the borrowing company, they need to pay an arm's length interest. So it means paying an interest that the third party at the market will pay for similar, for similar let's say, uh, transaction or amount. Then uh, when we are talking about branches, it is important to mention that from, from a transfer pricing perspective, branches uh, are deemed, or transfer pricing perspective are deemed uh, as a separate legal entities and the same rules uh, apply to legal entities as well as the branches. And uh, usually it can happen that uh, some, some branches uh, perform local support services that are pooled and uh, they can provide certain, uh, for example, admin uh, services, HR, IT, legal support, and this uh, will be as well uh, important to analyze from a transfer pricing perspective. Then if we are talking about restructuring, we can uh, think about restructuring in three different scenarios. First scenario is, for example, that there is some new entrant in uh, Qatari market, then that will uh, mean that this company that belongs to a group, multinational group, would need to comply with local transfer pricing rules. Then if we have uh, a new company that is acquired, so one Qatari uh, group is acquiring maybe 
for example, uh, uh, Bahrain company, then uh, integration uh, of this uh, business or operating models is crucial because the uh, operating models probably will be different. One maybe will be centralized, another will be uh, decentralized. And then it is important to integrate this acquired business into already existing business. Then as well, uh, one aspect of redesigning uh, or restructuring is actually re redesigning or streamlining supply chain organization. That means that from a transfer pricing perspective, that will mean shifting any function risk or asset between entities or jurisdiction as, as, as part of commercially uh, driven supply chain uh, restructuring can have significant tax benefits, but not only benefits, uh, it can happen as well that there are uh, exit taxes uh, for, for this shifting or transfer of uh, functions. So that means uh, that needs to be analyzed uh, uh, as well. And OECD uh, guidelines, which uh, uh, Qatar follows has special special chapter just uh, on uh, restructuring business restructurings then uh, an additional aspect is uh, losses we have noticed that uh, certain uh, certain company certain taxpayers within the group are generating losses so while their parent remains profitable this is then a red flag for taxpayer uh, for for um, tax uh, tax authorities uh, because they will pay particular attention to the tp policy this is because an independent company would not tolerate recurring losses for unlimited period and it would rather under certain conditions uh, opt to opt to seize its activities so this is important as well if you are incurring losses then to discuss with transfer pricing specialists to see whether those losses are uh, triggered from a trans pure transfer pricing perspective or maybe uh, due to some extraordinary circumstances uh, then when it comes to secondments uh, this is an uh, example for example when you have short-term or long-term transfer or personnel among associated entities and this is very common common practice then the tax authorities will look if this arrangement is a service contract or something else they will look who is benefiting from this secondment which entity and not only who is the legal employer, they will look who, who will bear, uh, bear this, this expense. So this as well, if you cross uh, uh, to this situation, uh, across your um, uh, organization, then uh, uh, it should be considered as well from, from transfer pricing perspective. Working from home uh, is another topic, and this is very important topic now in, in COVID time. And we can uh, imagine that, for example, there is a procurement employee uh, uh, from Qatar uh, and works in his home country, for example, in, in India, there might be a risk uh, from a tax perspective if the time of that employee is not monitored and if that employee is involved in different activities, for example, in conclusion of agreements, not only signing, but as well negotiating uh, to those agreements. And then Indian tax authorities can claim to allocate those profits to those activities as they are occurred in their jurisdictions. So this, might, uh, this may result in additional reporting requirements, penalties for non-compliance and increased scrutiny. So working from home, tax application can be seen as well uh, uh, for business travelers, project workers, employees with regional or global roles. So if you have those situations, then as well, transfer pricing specialists will need to be involved. In the, this will be a recap on just uh, uh, most important or most significant business events that are occurring within the multinational group. And in the last slide, I will guide you through the uh, next roadmap for transfer pricing. As you will see on this, uh, on this slide, the next filing deadline is 30th of April. This deadline is uh, uh, for submission of the tax return and TP declaration. And uh, as we uh, uh, learned earlier, this will need to be started uh, analyzing the uh, TP uh, intergroup uh, transactions within the TP declaration already, let's say, end of February. Then the next deadline will be 30th of June, which is a submission of master file and local file to be filed under EBA. What is important to mention that the work can already start now uh, and not to wait the, the last moment because certain aspects of the local file and master file can be independently drafted irrespective of the of the actual transactions uh, and then of course the the last the last point or the last deadline is uh, end of the year for country by country reporting that needs to, to be submitted for those uh, uh, entities that uh, have uh, consolidated revenue more than 
750 million euro. So with this, I would like just to uh, to thank you for for listening, and I think this is a recap uh, what we uh, did in the past, and that now is the right moment to to consider TP implications, transfer pricing implications, and start preparing for fiscal year 2020 transfer pricing requirements. And that is not only compliance but the general uh, transfer pricing requirements. Uh, with this said, I would like to thank you for, for listening and submitting your questions, which we'll uh, start replying uh, until the end of this seminar. Okay, let me take the, the first question and we just uh, take that as they, as they come in. So the first question is, we are, I would like to address it to UMA. We are um, a, a group here in Qatar and we do not have uh, any international subsidiaries. Is transfer pricing relevant for us? Uh, probably the reporting requirements may not come in uh, given the, the fact that, so the master file, local file reporting requirements may not come in given the fact that it's a complete domestic group. Uh, however, it would be important to also see whether all the entities within the group have the same uh, tax, uh, you know, tax liabilities or tax rates. Uh, if there are joint ventures which are local and there are foreign shareholders, the transactions between, for example, a Katri shareholder and a joint venture uh, could have some TP exposures, uh, given that the Katri shareholding company would be at a 0% tax company, whereas a joint venture would have some tax. Uh, then it's important to analyze those transactions as well to ensure that they also meet the arm's length requirement uh, to, you know, to be able to demonstrate that there is no uh, tax um, shifting happening uh, locally. Okay, there, there was another short question. I think I can take it myself. It was uh, whether we share the recording of this webinar, yes, we will do. So we will send to all participants and there will be a second one from also the session of uh, of next Monday, today in a week. Um, the next question I think I will address to uh, Damir. Um, what is exactly a benchmarking study and, and why is it relevant? Yeah, so, so benchmarking study is relevant because uh, through the benchmarking study, we can determine actually what is the arm's length remuneration. That means if you have one transaction, for example, you are providing a marketing service. A Qatari entity, for example, uh, uh, is service provider and provides to uh, its subsidiary in, for example, Oman then uh, this remuneration needs to be determined. How to determine this remuneration? We will need, need to look for similar comparable companies in database, search for, and then look what, how they will be remunerated. So for example, whether they will use operating margin uh, as a, a profit level indicator, or they can use, for example, markup on total costs so that they cover their costs that can be external and external, and then to apply on internal costs, certain markup, for example, 10%. But this needs to be then determined in the, uh, in the benchmarking study. That means we will look for companies, find, identify what are comparable to specific company that we are, that is, for example, our client, and then to determine arm's length range that will be a range, so interquartile, that will go from, for example, 5% until 15%. Everything in between, it is fine for taxpayer to uh, determine this as a, as a uh, profit level indicator or the other markup. However, what is important as well to mention is that in case there is no benchmarking study, then the taxpayers may perform benchmarking study and then can do the adjustment. So that means we are protecting actually the taxpayers by performing the benchmarking analysis. And this should not be uh, uh, underestimated because uh, we will uh, try to look for those companies uh, and look for the profitability that you are targeting. Thank you, um, Damir. Uh, the next question, I think this is for uh, Diego, because uh, I know that in your previous life you were focusing on financial services when you were still in, in Luxembourg. Uh, so what were the, the main challenging 
you know, financial service institutions are facing here in Qatar when it comes to transfer pricing? What did you see now with this, you know, first filing year? Uh, thanks, Barbara. Yes, well, financial institution itself, the financial industry here in Qatar is evolving a lot. I have noticed that it's growing dramatically during this year. One of the main challenges I have noticed during this first year is that principal financial institutions, they have the, the, uh, the capabilities to do internal, compar uh, internal comparables. It means that they can compare the transactions they do with third parties versus the transactions we do, they do with rela uh, related parties. So it's important that they can register and prepare pro uh, proper transfer pricing policies and proper records in order that to, to verify and secure that these transactions are in line with the Einstein principle and that and there are no major differences between the transactions you do with your related parties and your uh, unrelated parties. And also, when we are talking about financing transactions, some of the key points that we have to consider, uh, we have, I, I have seen here, is that it's a common practice to to uh, to have uh, intercompany loans without interest rate, let's say a zero percent uh, interest rate. With the implementation of the transfer pricing rules, this is not longer recommendable because a zero percent, if you go to the market and you request a loan to a bank, it will be extremely difficult that they will give you a zero percent uh, loan. So it's very, it's very important that when we are analyzing these intercompany transactions, we also uh, we also consider the Einstein principle and that this inter, uh, interest rate is in line with the transfer pricing rules. We should consider several factors for the calculation of the interest rate and to, to have a proper benchmark. Let's say, for example, the tenor of the loan, the currency, the location of the borrower, uh, and the credit worthiness of the borrower. Let's say the probability that the borrower won't pay you, uh, won't pay this liability. And also one of the uh, new, something that appears in the, in the last years is that also some companies, they, did, they have intercompany loan agreements using the LIBOR as a reference rate. It's important to consider that uh, the LIBOR won't longer be uh, issued by the, uh, the British institution that was in charge of this. So it's a good opportunity that everyone that is doing this type of transactions to amend this type of agreements and to reupdate this reference rate in order to secure that you are using a correct reference rate and also you are in line with the arms length principle. So you, you, your, your probability of having any TP adjustments are, are zero or very, very minimal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Diego. I think the next question um, goes back to my short introduction and, uh, you know, talks about uh, the economic substance requirements which will be introduced in, 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 in Qatar. Um, so I would like to, to, to address these questions maybe to, to, to Damir. Uh, I'm just asking what what is the, the, the what will be the interplay with uh, economic substance requirements and the existing TP documentation of of Qatar taxpayer? Do we already have uh, a view on that, or what what would be uh, your input? So, uh, economic substance is very important from transfer pricing perspective because uh, in the, in the past. And this is now the trend in the in the world to have economic substance because in the past there were jurisdictions and there were entities in those jurisdictions that will have no substance that means that the profits will be booked in those entities but they will have no people so that's why it is important from tax perspective to ensure that if there is a company and there is a, a new entity that people who are working there actually uh, performing certain activities and that is called substance because once you have the substance then the the profit can be allocated to that entity if you have just let's say an empty box and you don't have anyone there but you are booking high profits then the jurisdiction can uh, other jurisdictions so uh, with whom you have a cross-border transaction can challenge that 
So it is expected uh, that this will uh, have an impact as well on the on the TP documentation, uh, because those entities will uh, need a certain analysis that they have the substance and then uh, accordingly uh, profitability in that in that entity. Maybe I can add, uh, you know, some uh, a little thing on that. So typically, economic substance requirements are interposed in low tax jurisdiction, or you know, also of course on on those nice little islands around the world, which which have no tax, like Bahamas. Uh, and because of course they were not so much concerned about transfer pricing, because the tendency of clients would always be to bring profit into these jurisdictions and not necessarily to take it out because of the the tax advantage. And there was, of course, the push from the EUCD and also, like uh, you know, to uh, to um, and, you know to, to to close those gaps and just say, you know, you need to have a certain substance in this jurisdiction. And of course, Qatar is also with uh, the ten percent is also not a high tax jurisdiction, so that's also they need to have uh, economic substance requirements. Um, what it means, I would say it will most probably it will be part. We don't know yet exactly how you know the documentation will will be, but based on 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 um, experience that we have seen in other jurisdictions, most likely it will be an add-on to to the tax returns. And of course, as as Damir mentioned, it will have an impact on the transfer pricing because the more substance you have, the more like you know it, it's part of a proper transfer, transfer pricing all analysis already now that you look at the substance, now it's just an additional requirement. Yeah, maybe just to add one, one sentence that in transfer pricing, everything is about the functions and the risks. And those functions are performed by certain people and the, the, the risks follow functions. And then that has an impact on the profitability. So that's why, and then you brought that down to this economic substance. Uh, and uh, this is why this concept is, uh, let's say, related to, to transfer pricing requirements as well. Perfect. I think the next question I will address to, to Uma. Um, we have two subsidiaries below threshold for transfer pricing reporting. Are we obliged to report transfer pricing documentation for the parent and the subsidiaries or only for the parent? So it's one, one, um, like one parent who is within the, uh, within the threshold sure. and two subsidiaries, which are below the threshold. The question is now, do all three have to file or only the parent? So the threshold has to be looked at from an individual taxpayer's perspective on the reporting. So if a tax, if a parent is crossing the threshold, but the subsidiaries are not, then of course there is a mandatory uh, filing requirement uh, with, on the parent to file their uh, TP declaration or master file, local file, depending on what threshold we are talking about, to file by a deadline. So of course the mass, the parent is the one for whom the deadline uh, is imposed on. Having said that, again. The fact that the transactions is between uh, the parent and the subsidiaries, it is important to have that analysis also from a subsidiary's perspective, because they could still be subject to an assessment where they may still have to demonstrate why do they think that this is at arm's length. And especially if the subsidiary is a taxable entity and the parent is exempt, like I mentioned earlier, then the onus may fall more on the subsidiary to to demonstrate that it is at arm's length from their perspective. Uh, so the, ana the analysis is still required, but the reporting would be on the parent. I hope that answers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think with that, we have actually reached um, two o'clock. Um, you know, we have, we were not able to answer all the questions, so we will come back to you individually. And also, um, if you found our, our a webinar interesting uh, and would like to listen it again uh, as i mentioned we will have a second one on next monday uh, maybe if you want you can also look into the questions again and and ask you for the questions so we'll be more than happy to have a, a lively discussions as this time with that i would like to thank you very much for your attention and look forward to talk to you in another webinar about uh, another topic thank you very much thank and you. have a good day thank you everyone for joining have a nice day Thank you for joining. Have a nice day.